Jason Barney here for Educational Renaissance. Today I want to continue expanding narration's history with Comenius, this time through delving into Comenius's The Analytical Didactic. So in my previous lecture, I expanded narration's history from an earlier series by looking again closely at John Amos Comenius, this great Czech educational reformer from the late uh, Reformation era who has so much to add on narration. And at the time, I uh, knew there was more but hadn't had the chance to go in depth in my study of Comenius. So I um, have come back to it to look at the great didactic in the previous lecture. And now we're looking at the analytical didactic. And the big picture here in this series on the history of narration is trying to find the value for this um, particular teaching practice of narration when the student retells in detail in a long form what they have taken in, what they have absorbed in terms of content through some other means. So it may be a rich text as Charlotte Mason often has in mind, but there's this great history of narration being used all the way back into the classical era. And so we started with looking at how Aelius Theon, one of the great rhetoric teachers out of Alexandria, had proposed that students narrate or write a written narration from one reading of a text. And he did this for the purpose of developing in them rhetorical style and fluency in um, speaking and writing well, drawing from these great authors that he would read to them. Then it progressed to Quintilian, who saw even in this tool of written or spoken narrations a key to how to learn well itself. This activity of learning itself is encapsulated for Quintilian in the process of narrating. And then um, moving on from the classical era, we um, jumped to the early Renaissance and Reformation time period where Erasmus, among others, had used the idea of narration, this time from a teacher's lecture. Before the reading of great text, he would have students write out a narration of what they remembered. But really, when we get to John Amos Comenius, we find that narration has become the centerpiece, the central tool or strategy of learning. And so in his great didactic, we looked through how Comenius recommended through analogies from nature that um, narration should be done. And so he talked about the process of collection, digestion, and distribution using this metaphor from nature and how we get food, get nourishment, and applying it to the mind. And so there's this process by which, say, a teacher collects important knowledge, then digests it himself, and then distributes it to the students. And then, ironically, the students themselves, having received this knowledge, are turned into the teacher, ironically, to share that knowledge with others. So that's the big picture of John Amos Comenius's The Great Didactic, which he wrote early in his life. Now we're going to turn to a later work, The Analytical Didactic, which is really a section out of a much longer work that Comenius wrote near the end of his life called The Methodus, a work on methods or the method of teaching. And in this work, the analytical didactic is really just a short part of it, Comenius changes from the principle of nature and using analogies from nature that he had earlier in his great didactic to a principle of logic. And um, it's interesting, the uh, version that I have, I would highly recommend that you get a copy of the analytical didactic if you're studying teaching methods. It's really profound. But the editor is a little bit negative on Comenius uh, in terms of his analytical didactic. He liked the fertile imagination and nature metaphors that uh, Comenius had used earlier and thinks that the 
methodist or analytical didactic is a little bit dry by comparison. I didn't get that impression at all. What I got was a sense of the bracing, clear air of truth just blowing through ideas about how we would teach children. What is the best pedagogy? What are clear and concise principles and their applications for teaching and learning? So that's um, where we're going here. Let's begin by looking at this section uh, really a, near the end of the analytical didactic is um, the most important piece for what Comenius says about narration, what Charlotte Mason later called narration. And it's in a section where he's talking about the um, importance of rapidity, thoroughness, and agreeability for teaching. So how do you teach rapidly? So you've got a good pace, thoroughly, so that students really master it, and agreeably so that students enjoy the learning process. And what he says first there concerns the idea of review and examination. Comenius says that the goal that we should have for our students is that they develop familiarity with what they are taught, that they really have the chance to handle the thoughts and ideas, the knowledge that they are getting. And then in order to do this, we need to help them through frequent reviews and examinations and use of what they learn. So we need to get students actively, even he says during the process of learning itself, reviewing, um, being tested or examined on what they have learned and um, using it in some way, practicing with it. And when I was reading this, I couldn't help but think of something similar that I had said in my book, A Classical Guide to Narration, about how narration is two things. It's both assimilation and assessment. It's the process by which students actually store something into their long-term memory. And that connects with the review idea for Comenius. And it's also an assessment, a way that we as teachers get real-time feedback on the extent to which students know something. And um, in this connection, I think one of the most powerful things that Comenius brings to the discussion is his analogy of a traveler going on a road. And the analogy here is that you get to know a road a path between two places by frequently going back and forth on it. You're going to get to know the signposts, where to turn, all of that by frequent use, by going backwards and forwards on that road in a period of time is going to make you thoroughly familiar with it. And this is the process that we should take our students along in. We want them to travel down that road initially when we share the information or knowledge with them, but then we want them to come on back the other way by narrating it themselves, hearing other students narrate or explain the matter. And then he even says we want to take digressions along little side routes so we get to know the path and where other wrong turns might lead. And uh, what he has in mind here is the process of analytical discussion questions, some sort of analysis of the ideas that are connected to the story or uh, content that we've shared with them. So again, the main point that Comenius is making here is that students should actually become the teacher and be asked, called upon to tell in detail, to explain something that's been explained to them. So we'll move then into a, a second main point that Comenius brings up, and I think it's great. It's that narration actually starts a process. It's not the only thing that we would do for Comenius, but it begins a process toward thorough, rapid, and agreeable learning. So he opens a new section with three questions for the teacher. How do you know if a student has learned something? he says, by their ability to repeat it. 
So we want to test, we want to get a sense of whether students really have learned something by testing them through narration, by asking them to retell what they have learned. Then the second question is, how do you know if some, someone, a student, has understood something? And uh, the way that you know this is by asking them a number of analytical questions about it. So there's the base level of learning, which is best revealed through narration. We might think of Charlotte Mason's statement that a student knows something if he can tell it back. How do you know if someone knows something if they can tell it back? But then there's this deeper level that Comenius is talking about here, and that's the level of understanding. Do they really comprehend the significance of something? And you get at that through analytical questioning. Then third and finally, he asks, how do you know if a student is able to use the knowledge that they now have? And his answer here is that they should engage in prescribed but unrehearsed practice. So you want to have students do some sort of activity or response that requires them to use the knowledge that they know. They shouldn't practice it ahead of time. And uh, this, I think, um, really adds to and connects with what I've shared in another vein here on Educational Renaissance, and that is the format for lesson planning that I view as a flexible structure, the Charlotte Mason and the Trivium, or the Trivium Narration Lesson Plan Structure. And you can see that, in a way, this connects perfectly with what Comenius is saying here. I didn't know about Comenius's three questions here, but the first step is introducing them to a rich text that has some content we want the students to master, to learn. And then you test them through narration. You give them the opportunity to store it in their memory and show you how much of it they have learned. After that point, you would go into what we would call dialectic from the tradition. So the first part, the reading and narration, corresponds to grammar, then we go to in, into analytical questioning, where we're trying to draw out from them the significance of something and see the extent to which they understand it. Finally, then, we could engage in some rhetorical practice, where they have to respond to the new knowledge that they have gained by applying it in some way, practicing it, using it. And so we prescribe this to them, but it's unrehearsed. It's not like we send them home, have them practice up a speech, get up in front of the class right now and present to us on this new thing that we've shared with you, that will give them frequent repetitions of it. Again, the idea here is that we're doing these reviews, examination, and use as part of the learning process itself. So we're not having a long gap until we do some test at the end of a unit. We're actually engaging in what we might call, from a modern perspective, frequent formative assessment, where we're almost immediately calling on students to show what they know. Now, the, the next step that I'm going to get into here as we um, come further in Comenius is really how he unpacks in more detail the value of the student becoming the teacher. So this is an idea that he had talked about pretty clearly much earlier in his life through the great didactic. But here in the analytical didactic, he um, goes one step further in explaining why it's so important and valuable for students themselves to become the teacher. And um, he says in a way that part of it is that they need to be in the habit of becoming the teacher frequently. And uh, it's so valuable for students to do this because they get to hear then demonstrations and explanations from one another and not just from the teacher himself. So the value comes in a repeated going over the same ground, but in a different way with someone saying it and explaining it to you in a slightly different way. This is why for Comenius, it's important, if possible, to have those students that you think really got it the first time to begin a repeated narration process. Because you want 
clarity for all of the students. So if some students could explain it better than others, we'll start with them explaining and then keep going and having multiple narrations or explanations of the content that students then are developing on. Another thing that's unique for Comenius is that he wants us to correct the students as they tell it back. So unlike Charlotte Mason, who's more concerned with, for young children, that we don't interrupt their train of thought, we don't nitpick their repeated ands and details like that. For Comenius, he's focused on the truth getting across to the student, as opposed to a kind of laid, more laid back approach. He wants us to make sure that they are getting it as it is, the truth as best it can be understood. And so he um, recommends that the teacher correct students while they're going through this re-explanatory process. Now, what I think we can do here uh, as we look at the value of what Comenius is saying is understand it from a modern learning science perspective. Because when he's saying that students should explain things or demonstrate them after the teacher has done for themselves, we're on the solid ground of retrieval practice, which is the gold standard of what we know works from evidence-based learning science. So when students retrieve something from memory, that's perhaps the most important way to help seal it in their memory and ensure that durable learning occurs. But then what Comenius adds is that there's an extra value for them in teaching it to others. So we're not actually just going for a bare explanation, but we want them to go over the ground again when you do it multiple times later on in future days. Students are then asked to elaborate on what they know, to explain it as well as possible, and they thereby make connections to earlier or prior knowledge that they have had. So this is the value of elaboration to use the terminology, for instance, from Make It Stick, which is a great book um, by a couple neuroscientists and a novelist that goes through some of the best evidence-based learning science that we have. So what we have going on here is this kind of double fold uh, st strand of retrieval practice mixed with elaboration to make it even stronger for long-term memory and comprehension. And I think that's what's getting us from learned to learned and understood and knowing how to use the knowledge that they have. Uh, the way that Comenius explains this and justifies it is very similar to what he says in The Great Didactic. So I'm not going to take as long to run through all of that, but I will note that, again, he references the importance of attention. The fact that having students do this sort of practice means that they know ahead of time that they're potentially going to be called on to explain to the rest of the class something that they just read or heard as an explanation from the teacher. This raises the bar for students and the fact of them knowing that they might be called on to do that gives them this moral impulse for attention. But then again he goes on to say that the fact that we are correcting them and able to correct them helps the teacher incredibly because now he knows what the students know and don't know, what they understand and don't understand through them giving him the feedback of uh, sharing what they know in their own words. This is such a powerful practice, and I would commend it to you to consider how you would flip your classroom in a way. Think about what it would mean if every student got in the habit of becoming the teacher. That would transform our classrooms. If you want to make sure that your students really know something, that they're actually learning, that they're engaged in it, and again, you might think right now that this would take so long to do, but Comenius is arguing for what will be the most rapid route. He's saying it's quickest in the long run if you do this practice of sharing something with them and then immediately having them start sharing it with one another, explaining it to one another.
Another level that he puts on that process is that students can be asked to go home and share it with a parent or someone else in their life that might understand what they have learned in school. You're making every student the teacher, and this is going to have a long-term positive impact on the world. Remember that Comenius is living through the Thirty Years' War and all this turmoil in Christendom, and he has this vision of peace, an ironic vision for how the educational work could actually transform society and the world at large, and he wants knowledge to spread, ignorance to be um, cast out. And so this process of making students into teachers regularly is going to help that whole goal. And it's, it's something that ends in joy. He has this great quote in German right at the end of this section of the analytical didactic that talks about this is our enduring joy or pleasure. In learning, we actually find joy. And it's by going along that road the right way so that we can become really familiar with it. We can develop that um, rapidity, thoroughness, and agreeability of learning. This makes me think of some of the ideas I've explored elsewhere earlier, the idea of flow and how we can find flow through taking delight in learning and all the shifts that are needed to make that happen. Well, this has been Expanding Narration's History with John Amos Comenius, and we've looked at his the analytical didactic to see some of what he added to what he shared previously in the great didactic. I want to end by letting you know that we're working here at Educational Renaissance on a few books this year and some webinars that we have coming up. So these are great ways to support what we're doing here. We want to keep creating great content and improving the quality of it over time. So um, some of the things we're working on is I've got a book on the history of narration where I'm taking a lot of this material, putting it into a book format, developing it out, making, so, making it really helpful for you and other teachers that you know so that it can be used in teacher training very practically to help improve the quality of what we're doing. We'll have a couple other books coming out by Colby Atchison and Dr. Patrick Egan later this school year. And um, if you can... Uh, look for those. They're, they'll be coming up and, and we want you to buy those and support educational renaissance by that means. Uh, another thing that's coming up is webinars. We're going to have a webinar on habit training by Dr. Patrick Egan coming up soon. So please check that out and we'll have a page for webinars coming up. Lastly, I want to mention that we're looking forward to doing two symposia, our version of a conference this next summer here. So stay tuned for more information on that. And thanks for joining us on Educational Renaissance as we seek to promote this rebirth of ancient wisdom for the modern era.